everyone. I'm George from Ireland and behind me is Anne Frank's house uh, in Amsterdam, this green door. So um, this is where the world's most famous ever teenage diarist um, spent the years, I think it's 1941 to 44. And it's open to the public. I have been in it. Obviously, it's, it's just closed right now because we're well into the evening. Um, so Anne Frank is a renowned victim of uh, the Holocaust. And um, she wrote this journal, presumably not intending that anyone else would ever read it, because there's some very personal revelations in there, um, which uh, just put a human face on, uh, on the Holocaust. An ordinary person, an uh, intelligent person, someone with literary gifts and a close observation as a, as a particular talent of hers, uh, what it was like to live in fear. Um, unfortunately, her diary ends very abruptly when um, she, she was arrested. So. Anne Frank was born in Germany, and I can't remember when, um, because she was about 16 when she died. Um, uh, so roughly 1929, and um, she was she was Jewish. Uh, so her father had been in the in the German army in the First World War. There was no there was no discrimination by law against German Jews from mid 19th century until 1933. There was some uh, there was some prejudice, but it wasn't that widespread or that severe till it really ramped up in the 1920s and even more so in the 30s. Um, and so her father was about 35 when he got married. Um, her mother was considerably younger. So Anne Frank had one um, older sister. That was it. No other siblings. And her father was uh, was a businessman. was was quite successful. And so it was all always going well. They were they were very well integrated. Uh, they were German through and through. Uh, they were they were liberal Jews. And there seemed to be no contradiction between being Jewish and being German been there for centuries. They were German citizens um, and uh, you wouldn't know them from Adam in a sense, though of course they, they practiced their faith, but not in a particularly obvious way. Anyway, then 1933 came the National Socialists formed the government and the Nuremberg Laws were introduced a couple of years later and um, uh, anti-Semitism was amplified. It won't go through all the policies, but the Frank family decided the best thing was to move abroad. So they moved to the Netherlands, uh, um, which is adjacent to Germany, and the, the, the language is a, a kindred language of German, therefore not too difficult for them to, to master. And he set up his business here, which, which did well too. Um, then in May 1940, uh, the Netherlands was invaded by the Third Reich, and uh, Dr. Arthur Seitz Inkvart was, was came here as the governor, and they got Anton Eder de Musert, the leader of the National Socialist Beweging in the Netherlands, who were Nazis to, to, to take over, and they introduced anti Semitic policies, which really went against the grain of, of Dutch life because the Jewish community had been welcomed in the Netherlands for, for centuries, and a lot of Jews from Spain and Portugal and elsewhere had moved to this country precisely because they were treated decently, which Jewish people weren't usually in the rest of Christendom. Um, anyhow, so uh, people were gradually being, being deported to the east to an unknown fate. There were rumors slipping out about people being killed, but surely that couldn't be true. It was, it was too horrific to be true. You've heard of too good to be true. The opposite, the opposite um, also pertained. So they decided to go into hiding. And also the Frank business was um, confiscated without compensation and given to Mr. Cooperhouse, who was um, Mr. Frank's um, second in charge of the company. Now, Cooperhouse, a very decent chap, and said, okay, I'll have to run it because that's the law now. But since the war's over, I'm giving it back to you. And so what they did is they went here very early in the morning and they went up to the attic and they hid in the hid there and that was the, that was the secret annex they called it and people were still working on the floors below and they had to be very careful not to make any noise in in the business house not to flush the lavatory so Anne Frank her mother her father and sister and there was um, another man a dentist and uh, his teenage son the, the the dentist's wife was a gentile so she didn't have to go into hiding but it's very difficult because food everything else was in short supply so they had to get slightly more food rations in they couldn't exercise anywhere. Imagine how maddening that would be, especially in a gorgeous evening like this. It wasn't worth your life to go out, trapped in there for three years, um, effectively incarcerated. But that was the only way to survive. But listening to the radio, BBC broadcasting in Dutch, they were willing Churchill on. Anyway, so she started to write her diary, which is a typical adolescent with the worries and preoccupations that would have. And the diary stopped, started when she was sort of still free before they had to hide in here about um, uh, cycling, about her uh, desire for boys and things like that, about um, petty rows and jealousies, things like that, the insecurities of the angst that uh, a typical adolescent would have run ago. Um, and there was that teenage boy, did they find him attractive or not? Like that. She rather disliked that dentist who was living there and sometimes he had to listen to her, her heart and she found that creepy for medical reasons he had to listen to her. Um, anyway, and then even some of her own lesbian desires, 
I don't know if she was primarily a lesbian, I don't really I don't think she was, but you know, a lot of adolescents wonder about this. There's a section in which says, oh, I wanted to fondle the breast of this other girl and blah, blah, blah. So some of that was edited out of certain editions of Anne Frank's diary. But anyway, um, we don't know who, but in 1944, they were betrayed. Someone found out they were there and gave them away, tipped off the authorities, and they were arrested by, I think, German soldiers, maybe some Dutch police as well. And so the diary was left there, and some of the people at the company found it and took it, uh, and took it away and kept it off. So they were all sent to, I don't remember which concentration camp, and Anne Frank died a few months later in early 1945, I think weeks before that camp was liberated of an illness, I can't remember which one it was, because conditions were so horrific. Presumably they had to do heavy labour, fed starvation rations, um, no sanitation, no health care, um, inadequate clothing and, and no heating, inadequate shelter in, in terrible cold and all the rest of it. So um, she died a few years later, her mother and sister died as well. I'm not sure they were directly killed as in shot or gassed. Her father survived the war, then the diary came out and it was published later and obviously it was an international sensation translated from Dutch into Mirana. Mir dramatizations we made here about uh, about um, um, Anne Frank. So you can go and have a look around the house. My dear German friends, every German who visits Amsterdam feels it's their, their um, uh, behoven duty to come and visit this place. Bound in duty, I ought to say. But um, I don't really agree because anyway, I don't want to hold. I don't hold any nationality responsible for that now, especially anybody who's alive today, because um, collective guilt surely that leads to racism of someone of my nationality or ethnicity did something wrong. I'm not to blame for that. Or if I do something wicked, someone else who falls in this arbitrary, arbitrary category is not to blame for it. And one of the lessons to draw from this is just how quickly things can deteriorate, especially when we have dangerous demagogues um, uh, espousing hatred. Because, you know, in 1933, there was some anti-Semitic sentiment in Germany, but no anti-Semitic laws. It was a democratic country, a country which had achieved almost 100% literacy very early in history, so technologically advanced, and you know, the birthplace of so many scientists and philosophers and composers. But um, within, within um, let, nine, let's say, nine years of that, was, was carrying out genocide on a huge scale. And even before that, things at a lesser scale. Anyway, that is a little bit about Anne Frank's house as well, worth looking around and uh, reflecting on her, on her travails and remembering just how fortunate we are to be free. That's enough from me, so please follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, and, on, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, other YouTube channels, British Poesy, and I can't remember the other one. Uh, it'll come to me. Oh yeah, my law, English law channel. Uh, right, toodle pit.